move to questions to the Environment Minister, and of course we start with topical questions. Uh, Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he could give us an update in terms of the establishment of the statutory transition committees so far? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was fortunately sitting close enough to Mr. Lund to hear the question. Uh, he was looking for an update on the, or the, the situation around the establishment of statutory transition committees. Now, uh, my predecessor issued guidance on the formation and nominations to the new STCs at the start of July. The recommendation for selecting nominees to be used was either De Haunt, Saint Lag, or single transferable vote. Importantly, this was to be based on the 2011 council election results and therefore reflect the, the democratic will of the, the communities that they were supposed to represent. It was deemed that guidelines would be more appropriate at this stage than regulations, as some of the voluntary transition committees went beyond the, the, the three methods um, I outlined there in order to accommodate power sharing and actually encourage good practice and, and, and fair representation. However, these guidelines have subsequently been ignored by a few councils. The, the vast majority have complied, but th those offending councils, Lisburn, Castlereagh, Balamone, Coleraine and Straban, they have also I suppose dismissed subsequent correspondence from myself on the issue. Trevor Lund. Yes, I thank the Minister for his, his answer, Mr Speaker. It does seem incredible that the body which, which produced the legislation, namely this body, to set up these new councils could not actually enforce a decent system of representation for the transition committees. But I understand that the Minister does not have the specific power to do that, either on any of the three systems he has, he has mentioned there. Does he, does he have any other way of putting pressure on these errant councils to, um, to, to, com to do the decent thing and produce proper representation? Okay, uh, thank you, M Mr Lunn. I have indeed sought further advice from officials and indeed legal advice on how we can resolve these irregularities, if you wish to call them that, and ensure that all councils comply and therefore that STCs can be properly constituted and get on with the very important business that, that, that they ought to be doing. I have also written to political party leaders urging them to speak to their colleagues on councils and emphasise to them the importance of displaying political maturity and putting the needs and democratic wishes of the electorate ahead of selfish party political needs. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And could I take this opportunity of congratulating the Minister for his appointment uh, to the Department? Um, could I ask the Minister, in relation to the uh, statutory uh, transition committees, uh, has he received any correspondence from them uh, in relation to open competition for chief executives? Mm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. McGuinness. That was handy. It's on the same subject. <laughs> I have received our correspondence from two STCs and a number of councils on this subject, and as a result, I've written to all statutory transition committees and all councils to clarify uh, the position and address their concerns. My predecessor took the decision to use open competition to fill the new chief, chief executive posts, taking account of employment law, the compendium of principles, practice and guidance notes published by the Public Service Commission and OFM DFM, and legal advice which indicated that these were new posts. Some statutory transition committees and councils have concerns that current chief executives could claim for unfair dismissal if they are made redundant because of the decision on open competition. Legal advice confirmed that the current chief executives do not have a legal right to be considered for these posts in a closed pool. Therefore, a claim of unfair dismissal as a result of this decision is not defensible. Indeed, 
The position is quite the contrary. The new chief executive posts must be filled by open competition and in accordance with statute, as this is now legislated for in the statutory transition regulations, which the Assembly passed on the 2nd of July. McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Um, uh, could I thank the Minister for his answer? And, uh, uh, the Minister has indicated certain uh, legal reassurance to uh, uh, councils and statutory transition committees. Uh, but can he assure this House that, in fact, the advice that he has received and has given to councils is, in fact, something uh, that will be upheld? Thank you. Uh, the open recruitment for the new posts must proceed in accordance with statute. Statutory transition committee regulations now set in law that the recruitment has to be by open competition. As I have said, it would now be unlawful to use any other method. The only potential for legal challenge would be as a result of failure to adhere to the recruitment process itself. This process will be overseen by the Local Government Staff Commission and will meet all required employment, best practice and legal requirements. Independent assessors have also been appointed to ensure that the process meets these requirements. All STCs will be made aware of their responsibilities in relation to recruitment, and panel members must uh, partake in compulsory training prior to sitting on any selection panels. Pat uh, could I ask the Minister, in the light of the Environment Forum last week, could he identify his, uh, his key policy priorities in the time ahead? Uh, thank, you. thank the member for the question, and I'll try my best to answer it. Uh, regrettably, I was unable to attend the Environmental Forum last week. I was actually at a, a pre-organised conference in Scotland on uh, climate change, which was very important. I, I met there with my Scottish counterpart, Paul Wheelhouse, MSP. <laughs> my, my footprints are big enough, as are, the, as, are, as are the footsteps I have to follow. Uh, However, I do have particular policies. I have had feedback from that forum, and I think it's a very important forum whereby they draw on experience and knowledge and opinion from across the North on a range of issues. My uh, policies would centre on different things. It's a very wide remit, as you're aware. I'm keen to increase further the speed at which planning applications are processed and hopefully approved and look forward to working with businesses and, and communities in order to achieve these results. I would like to reduce the amount of litter on our streets and the amount of waste we are sending to landfill by increasing recycling. I think what we have to do to do these things is to increase our engagement with the public to, in order to get them to uh, uh, take more respect and play a greater role in their own immediate environment and therefore on the wider environment as a whole. Like I had spoken, the conference I was at in Scotland was on climate change. Obviously, this presents us with huge problems as well, and is also a key priority of mine. Pat Sheehan. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm glad to hear that he is. Uh, has as one of his key priorities the speeding up of planning approval. And I wonder, uh, and I, I would say that that has to be uh, a key priority, particularly with strategic projects. And I wonder if he could update the House on the latest state of play in regard to planning approval for the three stadia in Belfast. Ella, yes, it is very important that we speed up the planning process. I said I'd like to speed up the process so much for approvals, but hopefully we can create a system where the consensus can be reached before an application is even submitted. 
This is a method that was actually applied in relation to the Stadia application in Belfast and has yielded differing results. Uh, uh, on one hand, you have Windsor Park, during which the pre-application community consultation flushed out quite a few problems and resulted in no objections when the application was made. Then you have Casement, which has quite publicly been subject to other objections. I have met with objectors to that project, and I, in the coming weeks, will meet with the Ulster Council, who are the proposers of that project. I'm very hopeful of getting an outcome that will be to the acceptance of, of both parties, and I, I'd like to do so quickly. Bartle McRae. Mr McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, would the Minister accept that any decision about shale gas extraction should be based upon the best possible scientific evidence, but that if the evidence uh, was uh, satisfactory, it would have an extremely positive impact on our limited energy supply and indeed may help us with fuel poverty? Well, I would agree entirely with the first part <laughs> of Mr McCray's uh, question that any decision has to be fully based on evidence and fully based on science. And that is why I am determined to gather all the information, all the evidence that I can on hydraulic fracturing before making any decision on any application. And it must be restated that currently there are no applications for fracking here in the north. <coughs> uh, my officials through the NIEA are currently working with their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland in an attempt to gather as, as, as much information as possible, only not just on this island, but from across the world, where we can look at the experiences of other countries. Obviously, some of those are telling positive stories in terms of the alleviation of fuel poverty. However, I would have a concern that some of these victories, if you like, are very short term, and what we don't have is any evidence of the long term effects of hydraulic fracturing, both on the environment or countryside, nor on people's health. Order. I'm, I'm very, very conscious, and I was very sympathetic to the member. If he looks at the oral list of questions, the question that is asked on topical is very similar. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying to the member. Order, 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 order. I mean, I'm going to allow the supplementary, but I'm going to listen. Well, I appreciate the direction from the Speaker. Uh, I will just pick up on the point, Mr. Speaker, in response to the question from the Minister, where he agreed with me that scientific evidence would be the basis of his decision. And I just wondered, given that we have science at Stormont today in the Long Gallery, a lot of scientists, when the Minister would be in a position to have gathered such scientific evidence and when he might be minded to come and tell us what his conclusions are? Well, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to give an answer to that. I will go back to my officials at the NIEA. I will see how their research is going. Like I said, there is no application currently on my desk or anyone else's, for, for, I hope. Uh, for hydraulic fracturing, and when any application does come in, it will be subject to the full and rigorous planning process. Katrina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister what reassurances can he give to councils and statutory transition committees that the DOE driven recruitment for senior officers process will not result in subsequent legal actions being taken against the STCs, the Statutory Transition uh, Commission, or the councils? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd probably give the same assurances as I had given <laughs> Mr. McGuinness a few, min few minutes ago uh, on, on the, the same thing. Uh, the position is quite the contrary. The new chief executive posts and they're, they're the only posts that we're talking about here. I, I've given the directive already that those below chief executive level 
will actually not be subject to, to, to open competition. But the new chief executive post must be filled by open competition in accordance with statute, as this is now legislated for in the statutory transition regulations which the Assembly passed on 2 July. There is a further concern about the failure to consult current chief executives on the method of recruitment and the potential for redundancy, as the current chief executives have no automatic right to the new posts, there was no requirement to consult with them about the appointment procedure. There also seems to be the view that chief executives are being treated differently to other staff, as I have outlined, but this is not the case. The current chief executives will have the same statutory tupe type protections as all other local government staff. Members, that ends the period for topical uh, questions. We now move to order.